We have to reframe mistakes as simply learning opportunities that can actually accelerate our growth. And then one of my favorite ways is to understand when, why, and how this perfectionistic part of you came to be. Welcome to the Wits and Weights podcast. I'm your host, Philip Pape, and this twice-a-week podcast is dedicated to helping you achieve physical self-mastery by getting stronger, optimizing your nutrition, and upgrading your body composition. We'll uncover science-backed strategies for movement, metabolism, muscle, and mindset with a skeptical eye on the fitness industry so you can look and feel your absolute best. Let's dive right in. Wits and Weights community, welcome to another episode of the Wits and Weights podcast. Today, I'm welcoming back to the show my mentor, friend, fellow coach, podcaster, Paul Salter. Paul was one of the earliest guests back on episode 33, where we talked about sustainable weight loss, emotional awareness, and the dieting mindset. Now, I invited him back to dive into mindset and rewiring your brain, which are his specialties as a hypno mindset and performance coach who has transformed the lives of over 2,500 clients. You're going to learn how to turn your excuses, your self-sabotage, your procrastination, and your perfectionism into massive action by digging beneath the surface to the subconscious mind. Paul is a master at hacking the human psyche, having helped everyone from elite athletes at the pinnacle of their sports to high-flying entrepreneurs and professionals across multiple fields. Paul has spent the last 15 years crafting his approach that combines hypnosis, subconscious pre-programming, and mindset shift training all aimed at one thing, helping you break free from the chains of self-sabotage, overcome mental roadblocks, and shatter the glass ceilings of limiting beliefs. Paul is also a registered dietitian, certified strength and conditioning specialist, and a certified hypnotherapist, as well as host of the Unstuck Yourself podcast. You're going to love his insights on how to stop procrastination and perfectionism dead in their tracks so you can finally get unstuck in your health and fitness journey. Paul. It is always a pleasure to see you and have you on the show. Dude, your intro just gets better and better. That was the best one I've ever heard. I sincerely thank you for that. And thank you for having me back, man. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, man. And I think the listeners have heard us talk a few times on different podcasts. And you're kind of, uh, you know, we're reintroducing you here because it's been a while. And we really want to dig into the mindset stuff. I'm really curious as we get into it about my kind of personal experiences with clients and others and even myself with things like perfectionism, which I know is just, is huge for those of us who, who are hustlers, you know, who just like are always on, always taking action. So, you know, we want to get into all these things. Why don't we start just at the top with the subconscious mind and understanding why that's important into, you know, as we get into these specific problems, the role in decision-making, the role in our choices and our behaviors. Yeah. So let me start with kind of painting the picture of like a foundation, which we can build off of the rest of our time together here. So the analogy I like to use that was first popularized by Dr. Sigmund Freud, who was kind of the pioneer of psychoanalysis is the iceberg analogy. And the iceberg analogy is a wonderful reference and comparison to how we can break down the difference between the conscious and the subconscious or the unconscious mind. So the way that this analogy works is quite simple. When we look at an iceberg, that tip of the iceberg, what we see above the surface, we can liken that to our conscious mind, which is where we are directly aware of our thoughts, our perceptions in that moment. But the truth is, we literally only see the tip of the iceberg. About 90% of its structure, its foundational integrity is below the surface. And without the structural integrity of that iceberg, we wouldn't see that tip. It would simply non-exist. So we liken the part that is unseen of the iceberg to our subconscious mind, which is literally the foundation of who we are because it's within the subconscious mind that resides our emotions our memories, our beliefs, our habits, our values, our creative power, problem-solving skills, and intuition. And collectively, that's who shapes who we are as a person. It shapes our reality and our identity. And the one thing that so many of us walk around blind to is that, yes, our conscious mind and our subconscious mind communicate. And yes, they want to work together. There's just a few challenges in our way. First and foremost, there's a one-way radio communication between the two, meaning our subconscious mind is always communicating upward, if you guys are watching on video, to our conscious mind. We can't yell down below to our subconscious mind and say, hey, stop believing that, stop feeling that. 
Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. And then second, as I'm sure we'll get into more, our subconscious has one goal. It just wants to keep us safe. The only problem is it's incredibly primal, it's irrational, and it's likely running some outdated programming that is no longer serving us in the present moment. And that is where the host of all of the challenges we face in every aspect of our life reside. So it's an interesting dichotomy because for many years, I was of the mind, Paul, that you know, you don't really have to understand the root causes of some of these emotions that you can move forward with action, that you can process and you can kind of take things as they go day by day and move forward. And like things like emotional eating, which are huge with those listening to this podcast, you know, you could either go back and understand the trauma, the emotion, whatever is causing that, or you can do some, you know, put in place tactics to kind of get around it and process. Are you saying that, that we have to understand that unconscious mind? Is there a middle ground, like, especially for left brain thinkers or rational thinkers who tend to think in terms of just like taking action rather than dwelling on the past? What are your thoughts on that? I think they're complementary. So when we talk about like the tactical X's and O's, you know, making smart decisions to set up an environment in the kitchen, for example, the pantry, the kitchen are filled with foods that are nutritious, delicious, and on par with how we want to feel, look, and be. Those are all wonderful. But more often than not, those who struggle with the emotional eating or the binge eating find themselves going through periods of time where they are operating so deep on autopilot, it is almost as if an emotion has hijacked their operating system. So in the blink of an eye, they find themselves in the kitchen, a sleeve of Oreos deep or a bag of chips deep. And all of a sudden, it's like they wake up out of that trance and like, holy crap, what just happened? And they might have had all of the the X's and O's taken care of, but every now and then there is still an emotion that hijacks their operating system. So doing some of that deep reflective work to understand what that emotion is, why it came to be, and why this learned behavior came about can really help them to not only uncover the origin of it, but ultimately give them the clarity and awareness they need to unlearn and ultimately upgrade that behavior. And when you got into this business, you know, 15 years ago as a sustainable weight loss coach, what was your knowledge base back then? Like, what were your thoughts about it then? Let's, let's say the first couple of years of your practice, because I imagine it takes a while to learn how important this is and learn the skills to help people with it. Given that I'm, I'm like maybe where you were 10 years ago, I'm just curious how that evolved over time and how early you discovered the power of, of what you're talking about. Well, first, I'm not going to let you not give yourself the credit of your growth and awesomeness (laughs) as a coach. You are much further along than I was, but uh, it's a wonderful question. I think very early on, you know, I have a background as a competitive bodybuilder and power lifter too. I joke, I used to be married to my fitness pal, but I too would struggle with bouts of binging and I knew what to do. You know, I was studying to become and ultimately became a dietitian. So I knew what to do, but I'm also a human being. I had those moments where hunger, sadness, guilt, anger, frustration, stress got the best of me. And despite my knowledge, I kept running into the same problem over and over. It wasn't a lack of knowledge problem. There was something else underneath the surface. And a quick side note to further illustrate this, which will bring it all back together. Like, you know, I I took a detour as a professional poker player for a little while. And You know, I was a, you know me very well. I'm a relentless studier. I love to learn, but I started to recognize as I played for bigger stakes with more money on the table, despite the amount of studying I was doing, this, despite the coaching I was getting, I was still freezing on the spot, not performing well under pressure. I knew what to do logically, mathematically. I could check all of these boxes, but in the moment, I wasn't doing it. So if we now go back in time to in the moment of one when you're one of your listeners or myself or even you on occasion are in the moment with that ice cream, those Oreos, faced with an opportunity to make a nutritious decision or a not so good decision, something else is going on that operates from an unconscious autopilot standpoint that we need to get to the crux of. And as I started learning that all the information I was gleaning was not helping, I knew I needed to take a different approach. So that makes sense because, you know, you can put in place all of the tactics, all of the barriers for yourself. You can, you know, put the bowl of fruit on the table and put the cookies away in the drawer and still somehow (laughs) your mind is going to lead you via these protective mechanisms, you call them protective or, you know, primal 
what exactly is happening? And then we can get into details of self-sabotage as, as the next topic. What exactly is happening mechanistically or physiologically or however you want to call it that is causing us to make what others would see as a rational, maybe irrational choices? Yes. So let's use, let's kind of operate under the, the theme or the lens of emotional eating. You know, we are most prone to emotional eating when we're in a very charged state. And that emotion differs for everybody. It could be stress, it could even be boredom and everything in between from anger to sadness to resentment and guilt. So that food is a way to soothe or cope to help regulate our nervous system. The emotion that we are experiencing has caused such a disruption and dysregulation that we in this individual I'll speak instance, rather I'll speak collectively, it's like we're lacking the skills to regulate our emotions in that moment. And what happens is these patterns are learned behaviors to help either soothe or to meet a need that has gone unfulfilled for a long period of time. So there's so many layers to emotional eating and binge eating, but one of them could be through the lens of literally protecting you from attention, from being seen, unwanted attention. This eating could be a way of belonging if your parents, your social circle, if they are all overweight and unhealthy and you start making strides away to that from that to live a healthier lifestyle, you know, emotionally, these behaviors are deployed to keep you in your comfort zone of predictability and familiarity because that's what keeps you safe. And that is literally the cycle that has kept our entire species alive for however long we have been in, in existence. I, I keep having tangent questions off of this because I'm curious. If someone were to go through a process of self-discovery, let's say, let's say emotional intelligence and self-awareness training, how much would that benefit resolving some of these issues in and of itself, if that makes sense? I think it's a wonderful start in the right direction. And to be honest, it might be five or six steps in the right direction, depending on where that person's baseline of emotional intelligence and awareness is. I think awareness is phenomenal. And the most valuable piece of awareness is awareness of yourself, your past, how everything is connected to who you are in this present moment. But at a certain point, awareness will only get you so far. Action is absolutely necessary. And of course, like we talked about, the tactical X's and O's are great to help reinforce some of this newfound awareness. But at a certain point, you know, the, the old cliche with every new level, there's a new devil. We're going to have to dig a little deeper to get out of our own way. I can buy into that, man. Actions, you know, people talk about motivation all the time. Um, I think I just had a sh uh, one of my quick wits episodes about the idea of uh, just the action leads to the motivation because you get the win. But sometimes there's a disconnect where you take the wrong action or you take an action and it doesn't give you the win uh, or what have you. But anyway, I want to get into some specific areas that hold people back. We wanted to talk about self-sabotage being one of them which I guess all of this is a form of self-sabotage, even the procrastination and perfectionism. So, you know, what's the psychology behind that um, specifically? And then how can we identify, you know, behaviors and, and the actions that we might take to change? Yeah. So let's start with kind of a working foundational definition. Self-sabotage is a deliberate, intentional act of belittling or holding back you from your own success. And it is literally a deliberate form of sabotage because at your core, you know it is not in alignment with who you want to be or what you want to achieve. And the way that I like to break down self-sabotage is in kind of two, two different ways. First and foremost is recognizing that it happens both consciously and unconsciously. And what I mean by that is we all have had a similar moment where we walk into the kitchen it's nine o'clock at night. It's been a long day. You know better than I do. Maybe it's a tough night getting the kids down for bed. You're exhausted from the office. And all of a sudden, you reach a fork in the road where you open your freezer door and you make eye contact with Ben and Jerry. And it's like, okay, I, I'm doing it. Screw it. Let's go all in. I'm having the ice cream. That's a conscious example of self-sabotage. You deliberately chose to go against your goals. But the other form kind of happens in the background. It's through those periods of stillness, quiet reflection, where we reflect back on the last three months or three years, and we start to identify the pattern of credit card debt, the pattern of toxic relationship hopping. So that's when the unconscious is made conscious. So I always like to point that out because sometimes it's very obvious where we're sabotaging. Other times, it's kind of an insightful moment that comes together through a moment of quiet clarity. But even more nuanced we have what I like to refer to as capital S self-sabotage and lowercase s. So the capital S are the big obvious ones. They are the binge eating, the gambling, the addiction, the numbing, and the scrolling, 
the infidelity, anything where it's a behavior that any culture, any person in the world is going to look at and be like, yeah, no shit. You're clearly getting in your own way. Whereas conversely, the lowercase sabotaging behaviors are the things that on their own might not stand out as significant, but they accumulate to pack a massive punch. So that's hitting the snooze button, missing workouts, skipping meal prep, grazing throughout the day, a few extra minutes mindlessly scrolling here and there. They're the small behaviors that when we take a step back, we recognize not the best use of my time, not clearly in alignment with how I want to feel. So all of these behaviors are taking place. We're all guilty of one or multiple of them, and they are all rooted in one single goal, and that is to simply keep you safe because they typically become more pronounced as you start making progress toward a goal, as you start leveling up, experiencing more success you know, in the health and fitness industry, in your romantic relationships, financially or professionally, they are behaviors deployed by your subconscious to keep you safe, to bring you back down to a level of familiarity and comfort, which is where your subconscious knows you can and have survived. For sure, man. The hitting the snooze, I did that for years uh, and I could understand why it becomes a comfortable thing, right? It becomes a habit, uh, becomes a way to kind of to, to bury yourself back into the bed. And, and I I think about the, from the moment someone wakes up to the rest of their day, they're making a million choices. I mean, it'd be interesting to know how many thousands of choices we make in a day. But some of what you're saying is so many of those are either unconscious or learned or we've lost the consciousness of it, so to speak, right? Because it's yeah. just become rote. And then there's big ones and small ones. So where does choice and willpower fit into this? Because I don't, I want people to realize there's a sense of empowerment, but there's also something we need to learn about ourselves and grasp onto to then gain empowerment. So where does choice and willpower fit into this? Through intentional opportunity to slow down. You know, we all want to do a, a million things and achieve so much yesterday. But if we continue to operate from this go, 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 becoming human doings rather than human beings, we miss out on the opportunity to connect with our subconscious. So, you know, as you alluded to, hypnosis is one of my primary change modalities. And like, the beauty independent of some of the other science aspects of hypnosis is just the fact that you get to enter a state of deep relaxation. And when we do that, whether, whether it's meditation, some people it's exercise, it's yoga, it's journaling, it's breath work, whatever your quiet time version looks like, that gives you a chance to what I like to call turn off the noise of the nonsense negativity that exists in everyday life. And it gives you a chance to connect with who you are at your core. And that's what brings back the opportunity to intentionally choose. And the more you can schedule micro moments throughout your day to set an intention for this meal, this workout, this work meeting, this time with my kids, this time with my spouse, that intentionality is incredibly powerful and helps you remain in the driver's seat of your life. I love having these discussions, Paul, because I'm always reminded just for myself to to take a break because you know how... <laughs> I know go, how go, you go, are. I am. <laughs> and, uh, and it's funny because I'm kind of in a fat loss phase now. And one thing I, I committed to do was just get more steps, right? Just walk mm -hmm. more. And I like to do that via things that I enjoy. But sometimes I realize the day is getting away from me. Where, where am I scheduling in that, that moment? So people listening, take that to heart. The idea that a lot of this is just the space, the relaxation, the grace, whatever word you want to use that gives you the ability to get this consciousness because otherwise you're just on autopilot. You're just going through the motions, right? And many of us get tired as the day goes on. And by the time, I mean, I, people can probably identify this. It's eight, nine, 10 o'clock and you're just zoned out. At that point, you're just done, right? Like you're not even yeah. in bed yet. You're just done. And here's something interesting <laughs> yeah. too. Like researchers will estimate that we have about 60 to 70,000 thoughts per day. Roughly 90% of them are negative because our subconscious is constantly scanning our environment to keep us alive. And roughly 80% of them are the same exact thoughts we had yesterday. So if you don't take and make the time to slow down and consciously change, you, you're, you're not going to change. Wow. Yeah, that's, uh, that's sobering. So, but there's a positive to all this. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna lay that on thick here. I did want to ask one more thing. Mm -hmm. What is it that people rationalize the most in your experience? Just not not just nutrition and what we're mm -hmm. talking about here, but in general, you mentioned the big S, the little S, like what are the top of the list so people could say, oh yeah, I do that. 
Well, I think what I've found in, in all walks of life that I work with is people are so quick to, just to downplay the significance of all of those little s behaviors. Right. Oh, this news button's not affecting me. Oh, it's just it's just one time. It's just one time is perhaps the most popular rationalization or justification I hear. And then you, you know this well with the clients you work. Anytime we ha- we force people to put pen to paper and maybe start logging those one times, and we can reflect back, and then it's the oh shit moment, like oh, when I do hit the snooze or oh, when I skip the gym, it was actually three times last week and 16 times last month. Like it adds up. So just the the, just the one time to downplay the significance of any one of those smaller behaviors is what I find people struggle with most. And we have to really help them bring awareness to how significant the accumulation of this little sabotaging moment can be. How did they get over that first hump? What What if they're rationalizing the need to track and decide and, and do it exactly what you're doing. In other words, you're chicken and egg of they're not even feel like they're in a place to do that. Um, what's, what's your strategy there? I like to ask the simple question, how is your life different? So I usually take two frameworks with this. I may say, just, just close your eyes for a second and just watch your life unfold for the next 30 days, paying attention to your productivity, your relationships with yourself, your significant other, your children. Like, if you continue on this path of skipping workouts, let's just go with that example. Like, what's your life look like? More importantly, what does it feel like? And then contrast that with the same question, but we eliminate that little less sabotaging baby here. What's the big stark difference that we're able to not only see tangibly, but also feel in our body? Because we know logically, oh yeah, I'm probably going to feel better if I don't miss this or I, I miss it far often. But when we can literally begin to feel it in our body, the experiential factor of that is far more powerful than just kind of like, oh, logically, sure, that sounds great. Yeah, that's a great technique. We talk about identity all the time and visualizing your future self. But what you just said is give it that contrast of what you're going to be now as you're living versus what you would be with the difference. So I love that. So one of the things that ties into this is just not getting that first step done. That's just procrastinating as a form of self-sabotage, right? So There are psychological triggers for all these different little subsets that we're going to talk about. What's specific to procrastination? What does that kind of archetype look like? Why do people procrastinate? You know, all the things. At its core, procrastination is typically a fear of failure. Now, there's many more layers, of course. And the one thing I always like to point out here is is kind of two, two important points to set the stage for this discussion. Number one, we are all biologically wired to want and need to belong, to feel accepted, to feel connected, to feel unconditional love. And that's simply because we're a tribal species. And that's how our species survived all these years. On the other end of that, we are all also hardwired to have three core fears, the fear of judgment, the fear of abandonment, and the fear of rejection. Simply put, in the past, if we were judged, if we were abandoned, or if we were rejected, we were ostracized from our tribe, and we either starved to death or were eaten by a saber-toothed tiger. As silly as it sounds today, that is still the same primal operating system that your subconscious is running on. And it's important to bring that out because sometimes our procrastination is very quick for us to say, oh, I'm just lazy and we adapt this label that doesn't serve us. But procrastination is typically fear of failure, which we then trace back one step further to one of those core fears. I call it the fear jar. Usually if we are afraid of failure, it's because we're afraid of being rejected. And now it typically works two ways. That fear of rejection can come from fear of success Because if we use the example, all of our family members and friends are overweight and unhealthy and we want to make a change, well, we're literally going to be ostracized from our tribe if we stop engaging in happy hour three times a week in favor of the gym and hanging out with other people or doing healthier things. And then in terms of failure, the same thing. We don't want to let those people we care about down because then we might be judged, rejected, or abandoned. So this procrastination is rooted in fear of failure. And what I have found is when we can get really clear on the core, the origin of where this fear comes from, what we're afraid of, and start talking about it logically, rationally, making it tangible, it's far easier to understand, to let go of, and to overcome. Maybe this is a good time to bring up one of the um, the questions from my community that's related to that, because I, I hear this all the time. You know, Somebody says, I'm still procrastinating and making excuses right there, labeling, right? I'm consistent with X, but I really want to do Y. Like it might be, I go to the gym twice a week, but I really want to go three 
but I'm not sure I'm ready. That, that's that's the label that I have from one of my community members when I asked for their, like, what are their fears? Where are their excuses and things like that? Um, let's tie that. Let's let's go with that concrete example, right? Someone says to you, you know, I just, I want to work out more. I don't go to the gym enough. Why am I doing that? What would What would you do next? I would simply ask, are you committed or are you interested? Because there is a stark difference between the two. And I think it's important to note to 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 speak to that saying it's okay if you acknowledge you're just interested. You just have to then accept the cost of what it means to be interested versus committed because it's a different way of being, operating, speaking, believing and showing up. When we are committed, we acknowledge that we are scared of X, Y and Z. And it's totally normal and okay to be scared, but we can't remain stuck there in a state of inaction. So someone who is saying I want this, it's a very candid are you committed to this or are you just kind of interested because it sounds nice? And again, there's no wrong answer, but the clarity in that answer will reveal a lot. And if they truly say they're committed, well, then it's an opportunity to push, to dig deep. What is that resistance? What are you really afraid of? And you know this, you're very good at this as a coach. It's more questions. It's pushing, it's pushing and getting underneath the surface. One of my favorite questions to ask when people start describing how something feels or what they're scared of, I just simply ask, what's the emotion underneath that? forces them to dig a little more. You know, it turns to fear. I'm I'm afraid of this. I'm afraid of this. And all of a sudden you get some emotionally charged answer. I'm afraid my husband will leave me and I'll have to be a single mom, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, oh shit. Now we got to the core of what you're afraid of. Turns out my mom was a single mom. I don't want to fall into that category. My life was hard. Her life was hard. And now you get the juiciness of it. And we start to get to have the chance to do some healing work there. That no longer are they afraid of that. We we reduce the emotional charge of some of their past moments and memory so that we can use that newfound energy to actually put towards the behavior change that they're trying to accomplish. Okay. So I have two follow-ups to that. One is, can people do this themselves? Because obviously you're a mindset coach and use hypnosis and other techniques. Can people do this for themselves? What would be a good exercise for it? And the other is, I'm curious, in the general population that you talk to, how many people are able to resolve that one or two levels deep versus really having to go deep, if that makes any sense. Yeah. So for the first part, like can people do this on their own? It's the same answer that's applicable across all domains. Yes. Is it likely harder? Yes. Will it definitely take longer? Absolutely. Like one of my my go-to sayings is the biggest way to accelerate results is to ask for help. So yes, you can do it on your own. And what I would say are the kind of the prerequisites with a foundation of consistency being essential and implied is you have some type of reflective practice. I don't care if you call it journaling, meditation, a a general overarching quiet time. Um, And then you have prompts and questions. And that's maybe where you're outsourcing to get some of those prompts and questions to dig deep. Therapy, coaching, all of these modalities are ways to accelerate your results though. Even further than the second question, how deep do you have to go? It's incredibly dependent on the person. You know, it, it is so dependent on their upbringing and what the, the challenges at hand that they're working on overcoming. But typically, the deeper you can go, the faster the results will be if you're willing to surrender and be open minded enough to go there. My name is Tony. I'm a strength lifter in my 40s. Thank you to Phil and his Wits and Weights community for helping me learn more about nutrition and how to implement better ideas into my strength training. Phil has a a very, very good understanding of macros and chemical compounds and hormones and all that. And he's continuously learning. That's what I like about Phil. He's got a great sense of humor. He's very relaxed, very easy to talk to. Uh, One of the greatest things about Phil, in my view, is that he practices what he preaches. He also works out with barbells. He trains heavy, not as heavy as me, but he trains heavy. So if you talk with him about getting in better shape, eating better, he's probably going to give you some good advice. And I would strongly recommend you talk with him and he'll help you out. Thanks. Okay. And and you mentioned the three fears of judgment, abandonment, and rejection. Where does fear of uncertainty come in to that? So like fear of the unknown in a way? Yeah. Fear of the unknown. So typically what I've found is that can ultimately be traced back to a fear of judgment because if I don't know what's going to happen, maybe I'm going to make the wrong decision. I could be judged for that decision. I could be judged or made to look like a failure because I responded X, Y, and Z way instead of A, B, and C way based on the unknown that was at my fingertips. Okay. Yeah. Just curious because I'm yeah. <laughs> that that's a big one that I face all the time is uh, people don't want to change. Uh, mainly because they're comfortable, they think they're comfortable with where they are now versus the 
discomfort of the change. And like, I think that's a great point. Let me share one more thing. I literally yeah. had a call this morning with a gentleman who was, to be frank, fucking terrified to dig into some of his past because he's like, I don't know what's going to come up. And like, admittedly, and we could speak candidly about it, he had a very challenging childhood, a very difficult past. And like, the thought of reliving some of that was incredibly scary to him. It made him uncomfortable. It made him anxious. And I think it's important to normalize that. It's very normal. And that's why going at it alone can prove to be even more challenging. And if you do decide to go at it with a coach and a professional, you know, they absolutely need to foster a safe space. You need to feel safe there uh, and sharing and going through some of those difficult times. Because even though, just like you mentioned, there's difficulty, discomfort in, in some of those hard emotions, the freedom, the peace, the fulfillment, the power, the strength and energy on the other side are just fucking indescribably awesome. Absolutely. And what you said before about just envisioning where you're going to be once you make that change is a powerful, powerful technique for that. One more thing related to procrastination is procrastinating on the changes that you have now committed to. Let's say you are committed and you know what you want to do. And maybe you've dug dug into the your past and you've done the reflective exercises and now it's more maybe this is more habit theory right which we always we touch on all the time of how do you actually get this new behavior to stick knowing that all those other things are checked off so something that's very common in in my clients that I work with is you know maybe we we uncover and we overcome a big mental block for example and that immediately infuses a sense of ease. So for the next couple of weeks, that new behavior, it, we're able to grease that groove a little smoother. It feels like it's more efficient and effective, but inevitably we hit a new point of resistance. There's always an underlying emotion that is still preventing you from um, normalizing or locking in that behavior to ultimately upgrading as a habit. So what I find is, you know, like, you know, that's why, as you know, like I usually meet with my clients every three to four weeks. And you know, I always dig into like, well, okay, when it didn't go well, for example, what did it feel like? And what, and then we can still go back, okay, maybe there actually is more work to be done on that anxiety domo, domino, that people pleasing domino, that fear of failure domino. It's likely that you just need to keep hitting that one primary challenge from a couple different angles before that behavior officially sticks as a habit. Yeah, that's a good one. Cause people will, people will often get unlocked. Like you said, they'll grease the wheels, they'll start making progress and then they hit a wall right? Mm -hmm. They hit a wall. Maybe that's a fear of the next. <laughs> it's all the yeah. same fears that are just rematerializing at a new level. One other thing came up there, procrastination. What is, oh, when people are dependent on others. So let's say spouses, that's a great example, or families where the husband or wife wants to make a change and the the other spouse is supportive. But let's say there's a, how do I want to put it? There's like a, a fixed situation that I guess can't be changed in the moment. Like let's say one spouse has shift work and they just, you know, they need to go to bed at a certain time that just doesn't quite jive with the other person's timing and the other person's trying to get more sleep. You know what I mean? Like, how, how do we do you just try to get creative and come up with alternate compromises and solutions? Or what are your thoughts there? Yeah, I think at that point, it comes down to communication. Yep. Um, and it's really having that. But it's having open, honest, uncomfortable conversations with your spouse in that situation. And perhaps, too, that's a wonderful opportunity to bring in a third party simply to get another set of eyeballs, ears, and a brain to help facilitate creative solutions. Because the chances are in that particular scenario you shared, two sleep-deprived individuals who are butting heads trying to find common ground are not the two best individuals to create the best solutions. So a third party could be wonderful in that situation. Fair point. Fair point. Yeah. I just <laughs> want to cover all the bases here. All right. Then we get to my favorite, which is perfectionism. So I, I did a very short podcast episode a few months ago about four, four archetypes of perfectionism. And I don't remember what they were. I had them in my notes, but they were intended to help people identify what kind of perfectionist they identify them with to maybe take an action. And I, I guess I'm the type of perfectionist, and that's a label, <laughs> who um, it's not that it has to be perfect. It's just that I want to you know, I want to make the right choice to move forward. Not, not that it's perfect, but I want to make sure it's right. Well, I guess that is perfect. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and I'm, I'm, anyway, tell us about perfectionism as a barrier to, to success, right? Especially for people who are oftentimes using that perfectionism in a positive way, I'll say like that just their general, you know, get it done. They, they move forward. They, they um, try to make things of a high quality 
but sometimes it then holds them back because they don't move forward and they get stuck. Yeah. Yeah. So perfectionism <laughs> is a really unique entity yeah. and beast. I'm, a, I'm actually pulling up my notes. I want to find a cool quote, but I'll keep speaking on it for, for now. Um, oh, here, here's one actually. So this is by Brene Brown. So just to kind of paint the picture or foundation rather for perfectionism, Brene Brown, you know, best-selling author of a million freaking books, uh, a really good thought leader says, perfectionism is a self-destructive and addictive belief system that fuels this primary thought. If I look perfect and do everything perfectly, I can avoid or minimize the painful feelings of shame, judgment, and blame. Now, remind me, Philip, are, how many siblings do you have? I have one. And are you the oldest? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So the good news or the bad news for everybody listening. So if you are the oldest or if you are, if you have siblings, you are more prone to perfectionistic tendencies. But if you are the oldest, I have found in researcher degree, you are likely most prone to these tendencies. And perfectionism is all rooted in how well your core childhood needs were fulfilled. So we talked about the acceptance, the belonging, the connection. But as a child, were you heard? Were you seen? Were you validated? As soon as baby number two comes, the amount of attention and time you get from mom and dad is instantly split. The more siblings you have, the more of their limited bandwidth they have to divide amongst others. So given that we are hardwired with all of these core needs, and these are really human needs, but they're much more pronounced when we're children because we literally can't fend for or take care of ourselves. So when we have to compete for that limited time and attention, our subconscious gets creative. It starts to develop patterns of behavior to help us get more of what we need. So one common example I like to give that definitely reigns true with me, between the ages of nine and 10, I was a freaking wild child. I was always in trouble at school. And if you reflect back, I was the oldest of three at that point with another one on the way. So I was just lashing out for attention. And although you look back and you're like, okay, you were the little elementary school troublemaker, that behavior pattern got me what was missing in my life. I got the attention. Now, was it the best attention or what I really wanted and needed? No. But the point being is that we're going to develop these patterns to get what we need. So with perfectionism, you know, at some point early on in your childhood, maybe you got a good grade on an exam, a test, a project, a good report card. You did well in sports. You did well in extracurriculars. You got a nugget of praise from mom and dad that was so inconsistent, you latched onto it. Your subconscious learned, okay, if I continue to perform in this way, I can replicate this feeling and I'm going to do it over and over again. So the one silly example I'll share with you is I'm a big math nerd, so I know you'll appreciate this, but I played this game in elementary school called Challenge 24. You ever heard of it? No, I haven't. Okay, so it's a card game where essentially there's like four or six of you who play it once. There's a proctor who puts a card down <coughs> in the middle of you. There's four numbers on it. You got to put your finger in the middle of the card. The first one there gets a chance to solve the problem. All you have to do is use all four numbers to get the number 24. I got real into it. I used to play all the time and practice and whatnot. I won a couple tournaments and then I can distinctly remember to this day that when I did not win a tournament, there was just kind of a nonchalant response from my parents. It was like immediate disappointment. I felt shame. So what did I do? I woke up before elementary school every day for the next couple of months and went through the deck. I essentially memorized the whole deck, never lost a tournament again because I wanted that validation and praise from mom and dad. <laughs> okay. So there sounds like there's different types of perfectionism here, right? Because mm -hmm. what you're describing is you didn't have a need fulfilled mm -hmm. and so you compensated for it. I, th I feel like there's another type too where you just have unreasonably high standards for everything. Yep. right? <laughs> that you might place on yourself. There's yeah. also the perfectionism where everything has to be perfect before you move to the next step. I don't know where I'm taking all this, Paul, but I guess for the listeners who are struggling with perfectionism, are, can we break it into like a few different types yeah. that then what, what would we do uh, for that type? Yeah. So there's typically three types. So number three. one would be self-oriented perfectionism, where we demand perfection of ourselves. It's the unrealistic high expectation that creates a false sense of pressure and urgency to be flawless in our execution. The second type is going to be other oriented. This is where you demand perfection from others. This is where you are incredibly critical and hard on those you work with, your spouse, your children. You can be a real bear or pain in the ass to work with, to be with. 
And then reflecting back on ourselves again, that third category is typically known as socially prescribed perfectionism. And this is when we feel pressure from others to be perfect. This is when we start kind of um, involving these people-pleasing tendencies so that we come across as perfect so that we are liked, we feel like we belong, we're accepted, loved, and connected, which goes back into one of those core needs we referenced earlier. Okay. So what do we do about it? (laughs) What do we do about perfectionism? Yeah. Because again, we want to avoid labels, but we want to identify Mm -hmm. where we fall and what, what we can do about it. Yeah. So we have to first examine your relationship with imperfection. Like, how do you feel when you, I use this loosely, make a mistake? How do you feel when something isn't perfect? And it's a reframe of that relationship to A, give yourself permission to make mistakes and to be imperfect. And it is then B, creating a sense of safety in making mistakes. You know, the truth is, depending on your upbringing, when you made a mistake, didn't get straight A's, struck out on the baseball field, it's possible your parents were so incredibly hard of you, you became scared to make a mistake. The only way to feel connected was to be flawless and perfect. So we have to start giving ourselves grace and letting go, giving ourselves permission to be less than perfect. We have to reframe mistakes as simply learning opportunities that can actually accelerate our growth. And then one of my favorite ways is to understand when, why, and how this perfectionistic part of you came to be. So I can share this with you after. I actually just published a a newsletter Yesterday, no, today, all about understanding when, where, and how this perfectionistic part of you came to be. And there's a few journal prompts at the end there, but it's really as simple as finding that quiet time again and reflecting back to some of your earliest memories where you felt compelled to be perfect, to perform without any mistakes, and just really understanding what was going on in your life at that time. What was that eight year old boy going through? What was he missing in his life? And how can you begin to fill in some of the missing pieces for him, the love, the connection, the belonging to help ease the burden of that little boy, which has a wonderful present day healing effect as well? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And when we look at the like nutrition, for example, a very common situation is the all or nothing approach, the trying to be perfect. Um, and part, maybe part of the conflict comes from the fact that when someone is going after a goal, whether they're an athlete, a physique competitor, whatever it might be, you know, there are parameters and there are like cause and effect as part of that process. And so you're taking action to create a cause and effect. And when you don't do it, quote unquote, perfectly, the effect is going to go off the path you intend, right? Just like with anything in life. So where do we reconcile the need for consistency um, and the need to give ourselves grace when we're not quote unquote perfect because we don't need to be perfect. Let's just put it out there versus perfection. Because I think some people even see consistency as a form of perfection, if that makes any sense. It does. And without bringing in too much spiritual woo woo to answer that question, you know, at the end of the day, it's just recognizing that. Every decision and outcome, it just is. And you have the power to control how you respond because you're always in control of your effort, your attitude, and your actions. So these pivots, these unexpected changes in direction, course, or pathways to get where you want to be, they happen to teach you something to remind you something, to give you another chance to learn a lesson you might have, you should have been able to learn maybe many moons ago. So when we wrestle with the idea of consistency, giving myself grace, we should always give ourselves grace and compassion and always trust to be true that we're doing the best we can. We're not literally trying to get in our own way on a conscious level every single day. We don't wake up and think, how can I screw up my goals today? It does happen unconsciously. And we have those micro moments of little less sabotage. But at the end of the day, like, it's just an opportunity to learn. And the more we can really lean into that, the more we experience a lightness, a lessening of the pressure that we constantly put on ourselves or have other people put upon us. I like how you said that we we have this volition, this free will, this ability to control what you said, effort, attitudes, and actions, right? We always have the choice, even though from what we were talking about earlier, the context could be there are many unconscious choices. Again, I want to make sure to use the right word if we're making choices or not, even if they're unconscious, where they can coexist 
And it's almost like we're we're trying to get the higher and higher, you know, the iceberg to become higher above the water in a way. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. So that our a- effort, actions, and attitudes predominate th- what we're doing and what the outcome is. Do you, does that make sense? It does. And to build off of your iceberg mention there, we want to create what's known as mindset congruency. We want your conscious mind and your <clears throat> unconscious mind on the same page because when they are on different pages, the unconscious mind always wins. And what I mean by that is like, if you are just trapped in a scarcity mindset, you grew up, money is tight, rich people are, are evil, money doesn't grow on trees, but here you are, you know, all of that gets embedded into your subconscious. But if you're here consciously, I want a million dollars tomorrow, I'm worthy, this, that, the other, there's a clear disconnect or contrast and incongruency between the two. And your unconscious is always going to win. So you're always going to default back to that scarcity mindset unless you dig in and do that deep work necessary to heal some of those money-rooted wounds. So we have to create congruency. And that's why there's just so much power in reflective work, slowing down to really give you yourself a chance to slow down, to connect with your subconscious and start rewiring some of those beliefs patterns that exist. I knew you'd have a name for it. So that's good. Mindset congruency. But also I'm thinking of a, uh, I'm thinking of a, what do you call it? Seesaw, right? Where, or a balance where on one hand you have this friction, this, this big sense of friction that's created by the lack of awareness of the unconscious. And on the other side, you have your action and your intention, right? And we're just trying to lighten that load over there. So you don't need as much, you know, force or uh, willpower, whatever it takes to move it in the right direction. That kind of comes to mind. Yeah. And that's the beauty too. Like one of the kind of the under the surface or under the radar rather benefits of like hypnosis and some of this deep work is when you heal some of these emotionally charged core wounds, you know, you get the benefit of all that healing. But what happens is all of the the, the negative emotions that we're prone to holding onto, you know, guilt, grief, anger, resentment, sadness from areas of our life. Those are very energetically expensive emotions. So when you do the necessary healing work, you free up all this energy all of a sudden. And you and I both know forming a habit is incredibly energetically expensive. But with this new energy, all these behaviors that we've struggled to try to change suddenly become easier because we have so much more energy, which is a phenomenal place to be. Yeah. So not only have you reduced the friction, you've transferred that energy to the other side of the ledger. Beautiful. Yes. Okay. So. To wrap up here, I want to touch on dieting or you know, touch on nutrition, training, you know, fitness, health, all of that in a couple areas. So I guess two things come to mind. One is from our community, one of the other struggles or challenges someone mentioned was with emotional eating tied to stress when their life is such that there are so many stressors on them, you know, that are quote unquote, not in their control, but, but we can talk about that. Um, (laughs) like, like they have a child and their child has poor health and they're dealing with that. And, you know, a a busy mom who's taking care of their whole family and everyone's dependent on them. And then they're not quote unquote, able to commit fully, even though they're in their mind deeply wanting to commit. Yeah. Like, what are your thoughts on that? So I I want to give credit where credit's due. Ed Milet popularized this concept. This is mine, but it's known as like your emotional home. We all have these foundational emotions that are home to us. We come back to, they might be confidence, joy, and love, but we also likely are filled with grief, sadness, negativity. The world is out to get me. So we operate with these core emotions that essentially facilitate how we behave. And if emotional eating is how one of these behaviors manifests, stress is a conductor. Stress just amplifies the ease in which we can behave in that negative and counterproductive way. So when you think of like stress, stress is never the core emotion. Stress is a byproduct of life. Stress is good. It can be counterproductive depending on your response to it. But stress is is amplifying the core wound. So you have to get to the core wound and not just think of all these surface level stress management strategies. Like I like to say like, you know, when you attack the surface level, it's like putting a Band-Aid over a bullet wound. It's a short-term solution. It doesn't stop the bleeding and it's not a long-term fix. So stress is kind of that middle road. It's what we see. It's what we feel. So it's logical to go to what we see and feel and try to solve the problem there, but it's not the core or the origin of that problem. We have to go deeper and understand where, when, and how this part of you that is sabotaging yourself came to be. What is the emotion in there that is connected to it? Yeah, that makes sense. Like so many things, there's often a root cause. 
the yeah. symptom may not be indic indicative of it. And if you just put a bandaid on the symptom, it could give you some, you know, minor temporary relief, which then may slow you down from <laughs> fixing the root cause, you know, so we got to go right to it. We see it all the time with like people, they do a diet, it works for three to four weeks and then it's, but it's, it never fixes the core issue of their binging, their emotional eating. So they have some success. Oh, this approach doesn't work for me. They try another Band-Aid. It works for a month. They revert back to their old way and they try another and 20 years go by and they're still having the same conversations and frustrations. Yeah, I just tell people just eat more food and build muscle and don't worry about it. You know, I like that. <laughs> all right. Is there anything else you wanted to cover in these? Because these are these can be some very big, deep topics that could each be its own episode as they are on your podcast on a regular basis. So is there anything else you wanted uh, that you wish I had asked or any other topic you wanted to cover? Yeah, I think one question that I often get asked is like, who who needs mindset and performance coaching? And oh. like, it, it's a weird dichotomy. Like you and I have this discussion, like niche down, niche down, get really, really specific on like who you want to work for. And like the beautiful thing here is like, we all can benefit from having a trusted, safe professional to help you dig into some of the discomfort and emotionally charged situations of your past and to do so in a way to set the intention of learning from, of healing so that you can move forward and ascend to that next best level of, of who you are. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, I can't tell people enough that when there's an area of your life that you are committed to and you identified you're committing to it, why wouldn't you pull on all the resources possible? And oftentimes a third party resource, that's that's a level of stress reduction right there, right? Because now you're not wondering, okay, what book or podcast do I have to read? What exercise do I have to do? When do I do it? How do I do it? Um, so that's great. And just so people know, I personally had a session with Paul not long ago, and, and it was fantastic for uncovering some things that I wasn't aware of. And so if as far as trusted, safe and professional, he's your man. So Paul, where can people find you and connect with you? Yes, the best place is on Instagram at Paul Salter Coaching. I'm active there daily. It's a wonderful hub or library of just education and resources all about the subconscious mind, self-sabotage, everything under that umbrella topic that we hit on. And then like you mentioned so kindly, the Unstuck Yourself podcast, I'm there live every Thursday as well. All right. Uh, the Unstuck Yourself podcast and IG at Paul Salter Coaching. We're going to include that in the show notes as always. And I really love talking to you always. And you know, we always go into a different direction each time. And it's a pleasure to have you on. Yeah. Thank you, Phil. It's an absolute pleasure from my end. I always thoroughly dis enjoy these discussions. All right, we'll be talking again soon. Yep, take care, man. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Wits and Weights. If you found value in today's episode and know someone else who's looking to level up their wits or weights, please take a moment to share this episode with them. And make sure to hit the follow button in your podcast platform right now to catch the next episode. Until then, stay strong. Hey, before you go, I want to let you know about a free resource I have. They are free guides on everything from fat loss to eating out to building muscle to managing hunger to figuring out the best macros for you and more being added all the time. You want to get the most out of these podcasts and your time to look and feel your best. And these free guides will give you a quick and easy way to know what to do. If you want to get your hands on these completely free guides, you can head over to witsandweights.com slash free. That's witsandweights.com slash free to get your free guides and level up your results today.